Holy clock stoppers, Batman! Tiki here, and I am watching through Batman the Animated Series for the first time on my inaugural voyage. Tonight, we've got into an episode that, uh, oh man, it's, uh, <laughs> not the greatest. It's not the greatest, so I'm going to need a little assistance. Tell them why, Dragon. Well, you see, folks, long ago I made a vow, a vow to educate Tiki in the ways of Batman the Animated Series, serving as his spirit guide to Gotham, in a way. That's right, and tonight we're talking about time out of joint. Oh, Dragon. First of all, I want to acknowledge one thing, all right? Captain James Logan loves Clock King. And I want to just respect his love for the character. I just want to call it out, like, in case he happens to be watching this, in case any of his fans happen to be watching this. I don't want any Geek Volution fans going back and saying, like, Hey, Cap Tiki hates Clock King! I respect the character. I like the character. Dragon, this episode might be the most mediocre episode of Batman the Animated Series. And you know how I feel about mediocrity! Well, give, we, can you say it with a flourish? Can you? I'd you know? rather have bad. I'd rather have bad. I mean, this is not it? even bad. It's just mediocre, and I don't like it. In other words, mediocre. Mediocre. Uh, mediocre. So I'm saying you gotta say at least the cushion, the blow. Can't you go mediocre? <laughs> yeah. But Dragon, honestly, honest to God. I don't want to get too inside baseball here, folks. Of course, like, we try to record this, like, five times. Things keep getting in the way. I've had to watch this episode a number of times. I didn't like it the first time I watched it. And each subsequent time, I'm like, I'm going to find something to like about this. I'm going to find something to really latch onto here. And, Dragon, I want to reiterate, it's not that the episode is bad. But I would like bad. You know me. I would embrace bad. This is just so middle of the road. So goddamn middle of the road. And that's my honest to God take on it. Like I said, the fact that we had to re record this so many times definitely doesn't help. But we haven't re recorded it. We haven't re we're just now recording it. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh so yeah, Dragon, this just did I'm not feeling this one, my friend. I'm really not. Uh and like I said, I, I totally respect anyone who likes the Claw King, and I like him too. I think he's a fun character. I think he's got a fun gimmick. I just don't think the framework around this episode is very good. Just for some reason, this episode just doesn't... It's just... It doesn't play well for me. I, I, I honestly don't know why. All right. Well, well, for starters, again, to you, regardless, of everyone with the Clock King love, they're usually not thinking. They're usually thinking of the first Clock King episode, not really this one. Just, just for just to alleviate some of the straight, just the character in general. Because I've yeah, seen I mean, a it's lot the of character in general, but especially he's like, the, of course, Batman did a really fresh kind of statement, restatement on the Clock King. Basically, it's like they. Clock King is a Green Arrow villain. He's basically the guy with the giant clock face. So like, if you watch Batman Brave and the Bold, they pay homage to, like the classic Clock King. Then Batman kind of made him cool. He gave him like the suit. And basically, what if he was a real human guy who just uh, who just knew time so well and that he caused him to snap? Basically, the Batman series made him dramatically interesting, which basically is why people love the Clock King. And oddly enough, uh, you get the Arrow show on the CW back when it was good. This is within like that two seasons of like goodness from Arrow, but uh, season two. <laughs> I think it was season two, you get the Clock King, and they they do their stamp on the Clock King, which, again, inspired by kind of the Batman version, and kind of, it's so weird how that works. Again, Green Arrow character turned into a Batman character, then turned back into a Green Arrow character in our very Batman-inspired Green Arrow show. It's trippy. The point being, <laughs> the point being like, that, those are the versions uh, uh, Captain Logan on Geek Pollution loves as well, just to kind of get that out there, too. The point being, there's a lot to love about the Clock King. Of course, even when I, uh, when we did Super Cat, what well, well when we uh, when we were watching Super Academy and everything, we were really into it. And of course, I kind of uh, I'm sorry, guys, folks. I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but again, when the character fracture, I kind of had a I had a small hand in, in kind of making happen. I modeled him after the Clock King in many respects, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what ended up being there. Again, Clock King's just so much to love in uh, the animated series, a stamp on that character, and just like when I think Clock King, he's a very he's very underutilized these days. By the way, there's not enough done with the Clock King. I've seen he has like three appearances in the anim in the DCAU, and this is the second out of the three. And you're not going to see the third one in Batman. The third one's in Justice League. It's a really ah. great. They, they put him on the Suicide Squad, and it's fantastic. He plans out the caper, and it's great. <laughs> anyway, 
Point being, um, getting back on points, a little bit of context for this episode. Not a whole lot. Just um, This was directed by the great Dan Riva. Dan Riva, responsible for uh, See No Evil and Trial, to give you an example from Season 3. Uh, this was written by, again, had, a, had kind of a... You have kind of a mixed bag with the writers. You have, of course, the great Alan Burnett, uh, who did Two-Face. Gotta love him. Of course, you know, the guy who's involved in all animated Batman stuff, Alan Burnett. And you have uh, Steve Perry. Now, Steve Perry, he has a reputation in the animated series, especially in kind of this third volume, third season that we're in. Steve Perry is the sequel guy. He's been responsible for a lot of the <clears throat> reappearances of our Batman villains, like Day of the Samurai, Steve Perry. Mudslide, Steve Perry, Terror in the Sky, you get the point. Sure. So this is his uh, kind of resurgence of the Clock King. Uh, the studio that did this was Dong Yang. Of course, when Spectrum's away, Dong Yang will play. <laughs> of course, uh, they've uh, again. I'm connecting a theme here because See No Evil, which also gets name dropped in this episode. It well, not by name, but it gets referenced in this episode. Of course, you know Dan Reba and Dong Yang's little, little See No Evil reunion, which is quite nice. The Invisible Man episode. Um, we have, uh, you know, the, the Stang Yang also did Trial recently, and Harley Quinn, which again, an episode that animation-wise turned out fantastic. Harley Quinn, of course, Harley Quinn, wonderful episode. Point being, good talent on the episode in terms of making it happen, make, kind of bringing it back. We're bringing back the Clock King in style, because, you know, uh, first Clock King episode had a really good animation studio. On it. They had uh, they had Sunrise, the guys who did uh, one of my all-time favorites, uh, I Am the Night. So this is kind of like a different studio doing it, but still, like, dude, quality animation for the Clock King. You can't take that away from them. <laughs> okay, so this uh, continues the revenge arc for the Clock King, um, who famously got away at the end of his episode as well. Again, Batman did not catch the Clock King. That's why he's free and uh, kind of like popping back into things here. A little, little note: Rid only the Bat, only Clock King and Riddler have evaded Batman. If you really think about it, in the animated series. Yep. Yep. Uh, one more thing I'm going I'm to throw out here because this is something you might want to know because you're never going to see in the animated series. Um, in the tie-in comics, which are really great, um, there is a third part. There is a really great finale to the Clock King story um, within the Batman universe where in the, in the tie-in comics, they did the whole Penguin becoming mayor story. They're really neatly. It's a, real, it's a, it's a brief tenure, but basically the Penguin became mayor and there's this great it's a one issue story where basically the penguin he he thinks he was elected mayor even though Gotham's like we don't want him we don't want him he's like well you elected me and anyway so of course penguin uh, being the mayor of Gotham like anti vigilante stance and everything it's not going Batman's way and basically Batman confronts the penguin and basically did some detective work and he found out the only reason the penguin became mayor was because it the Clock King messed with the election so Mayor Hill wouldn't get reelected. So that was his ultimate revenge, and it was kind of like a crushing blow to the penguin. Like no one wanted me. You were like the sixth. You're like sixth in the polls. No one wanted you. <laughs> but seriously, I just love that idea that the Clock King was that was his ultimate revenge. He got the mayor de-elected. Again, got the mayor. Uh, you know, not he didn't get the mayor re-elected, and that's you know, kind of caused chaos with the. Anyway, I thought it was really nice little payoff that we're never going to see with him. But it was it was quite nice. It was a lot of <laughs> All right, all right. Okay. Nice. All that said, yeah, we're um, jumping right into it. All righty, the mediocrity begins, Dragon. The title card is really nice, and it doesn't really get that much more impressive from there. <laughs> oh, God, I'm going to be harsh on this one. I'm oh, sorry. The, the title of the episode, because you, you brought the, the title card, um, yeah. actually, it's it's kind of a sly reference to Batman 66, which uh, had the clocking appear. Oh, one major famous thing with the clocking. All right, all right, all right, all right. I'm, I'm kind of getting, Dragon, I'm not going to lie. I'm getting a little, you're kind of getting, a, you're kind of bombarding me with this clocking knowledge here, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, the only, the only, ep the only uh, episode of Batman that Bill Finger ever got his name on officially, Bill Finger co-wrote the oh. episode. So that's, anyway, the point being. Okay, that was, a, that was a fact that was worth noting. That, that That's like a the, nice fact. Awesome. Basically, <laughs> the painting in the clocking episode is called Time Out of Joint, so that's where they got the episode title from. Okay, yes, yeah, so Gotham uh, Ant Ant Antiquarian <laughs> Society. They're holding a little auction. Oh my god, I just realized, I just realized, Dragon, I, I don't know how I didn't put the pieces together on this. Yeah. Literally the first line is Bruce questioning Robin about being bored. <laughs> oh, that's You really that's didn't great. put that together with your whole no, life there? No, I literally, I, yeah, I feel stupid now, but yeah. no, just bored. <laughs> Reminds me of the Land Before Time sequel that literally starts with a song about them being bored. It's like, yeah, and th this is what we're in for, folks. All right, anyways. All right, anyway. 
I'm, 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 I guess I'm going to be the ray of sunshine by contrast with Tico. Oh, God. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not like saying... It's a rule we're familiar with, Dragon. I honestly feel like that's the uh, that's the dynamic duo at its finest when we're when you're the ray of sunshine and I'm the, cyn- the cynical asshole. All right, okay. <laughs> so we have... Like the uh, Laurel and Halt and Hardy of Imagineering podcasts. So Anyways. we have this, this fun auctioneer modeled after actor uh, Terry Thomas. Uh, basically, he looks exactly like Terry Thomas since Alan Oppenheimer doing a Terry Thomas impression. Alan Oppenheimer, he the voice of Skeletor, uh, Falcor from um, Oh, okay, from Never Ending Story, and he was the old timer in Toy Story. You know, like you know the old timer that guy. Uh huh. <laughs> um. So yeah, he's uh he's just doing a bit of auctioning, just uh, auctioning off this magnificent timepiece. All right, we Robin's bored, in- and I don't blame him. Yeah, Dick Grayson's board is all get out, and Bruce is there. Mainly, basically, Bruce is only there because the proceeds are going to charity. So, again, classic Bruce went, help now charity. I like that. So, <laughs> so point being, it's like, let, let, let's see. So, um, 10 minutes for you is like, oh, this is a great foreshadow, Dick. It's like 10 minutes for you is like 10 hours for me, which is a great foreshadow to the whole kind of the theme of the episode and the, the obstacle they're going to be going up against. Sure, sure. So next up is the Louis the Tenth uh, timepiece, uh, starting bid four hundred thousand. Uh, and and uh, Robin saying, "I would use that as a doorstop." <laughs> <laughs> so then we, I love the I love the reveal of clocking here because you hear the theme and then you, like you have this like the familiar theme and just that sound. Like here's a little weird sound. A guy just pops in using the device, which we don't know what the heck's up with that. Yeah, he just kind of walks it. It's the clocking as we pan up. We reveal clocking in his dapper black suit this time. I prefer One the thing brown. that I will never dismiss the clocking on Dragon. He's got a freaking excellent design. I know he's so cool. <laughs> I mean, it's such a better I love redesign. That cane. Yeah, <laughs> so much better. When he was wearing like a clock mask for a face, it's so much better. <laughs> oh God! Wait, was that how he was in the comics? Yeah, yeah, and like the old oh, one, like Raven the Bold shows you what it looks like. When he has like, a clock for a face. He just wore like a mask, though. Anyway. Oh, that's a stroke of genius that they got rid of that. Wow. You know what I'm saying they gave him like the glasses. <laughs> it's such a better idea giving him the glasses, like the little clock hands on. Uh, anyway. uh. So, uh, of course, a perfect intro line for the clocking. Right on time. As oh yeah. <laughs> So he uses this mystery device on his belt to disappear and accelerate time to disappear. Uh, he surprises the program girl, uh, was by Tress McNeil here. Uh, you know, like uh, then of course he pulls a bad exit on her. Uh, it's like, oh yeah, the auction just started. Like, boom, she disappears. And it's like, oh, I need to see my optometrist. Like, what the <laughs> what the heck, this guy? I, I, I saw him. So let's see. So uh, Bruce, he bids now. He's bidding up to six hundred thousand. Do I hear six? Who makes it six? Sorry, just want to work in a Pirates of the Caribbean reference. <laughs> of course, like Robin's like, can you like time is money? But after time is money, this is ridiculous. So then, uh, now this is really nice. Though. I like how Robin's kind of like while he's just doing his little comedy shtick here, he's kind of realizing, hey, what? Oh my god, I think that's that's the clocking. Isn't he? he spots the clocking, then disappears. Um, like Batman's like, okay, don't don't be all antsy. It's almost over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is going to sound crazy. I think I just saw Temple Feud. I think I just saw the Clock King. So the uh, as the auction ends, well, again, Bruce didn't get that thing. By the way, like another guy bet six fifty. Oh, here's six fifty. Six fifty, and then the auction ends, going, going, and gone. Of course, as he says, gone very appropriately. Disappears, and he says, "Blimey!" All right, I, I got to admit, Dragon, having no context for who this guy's based off of. All right, I, I want to just keep that in mind. When he said blimey and the buck teeth and everything, I just have written down in my notes, Diet Coke Nigel Thornber- Thornberry. <laughs> you know, I, I, was, I, I could be reading too much into it. I like to think that blimey is there for a story reason. I like to think that he's saying blimey so they have something to measure the time by later on. No, that's true. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. We'll get into that, sure. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so of course... Uh, now this, is was... timing, though. this is probably the best moment in the whole episode, I think. Comes very early. <laughs> the whole, like, go, you know, going, going, gone. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, Bruce and Dick, they see something's amiss. They're leaving in a rush. They get changed in the costume, see what's going on here. I'll admit, I don't know really what they intend to accomplish in that moment there, because they didn't see what happened. They're, they're not really going to be able to... I, I guess they're figuring, okay, Gordon's going to light the signal up. we got to we gotta get out of here. I, I guess. That's, anyway, point being, they're out of there. We have clocking in the alley. This is a great sentiment. This is a great testament to the character. We're clocking. He's in the alley, but she's done all this for a trial run. 
the trial run went like clockwork. You know, making these puns work so classily for him. I don't know. They really, really He's like the uber classy version of Schwarzenegger Freeze. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So then he ditches the uh, he ditches the clock, throws the clock, the the six hundred fifty thousand dollar <laughs> Louis the Louis the Louis the tenth just throws it in a dumpster. I already have. I've already got one. And this is what I love about the clock. He's all about revenge. He's not. If you think about, it, he's all about revenge before he's about crime in the animated series. You know, he's mm-hmm. he's not really robbing banks or anything. He's about getting revenge on the guy who ruined his life by seconds. <laughs> Do I really look like a guy with a plan? Mm. <laughs> All right, so then we have a Gordon Batman scene, but I get to spice up a little bit. It's a Gordon Batman and Robin scene. Might be the first one he's kind of sat in on, at least. Uh, <laughs> little... oh. Gordon Batman and Robin. Yeah, and of course, uh, classic thing here. Robin has to be kind of the comedian in the scene here. He's just kind of being, basically, add like a little youthful kind of wit to the to the Batman Gordon dynamic in a moment like this, where they're playing the footage in slow mo as slow as, as they're going to be able to get it for the auction. Of course, uh, you know, they're like blind me, and then of course they rewind Why? the footage. rewind the footage. All right, just remind me, Dragon. That's got to be the outro tag. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, they rewind the footage. <laughs> so then uh, Robin like makes a he makes a quick a quippy remark to Gordon. That must be it. The hand that's quicker, you know, the hand that's quicker than the eye. <laughs> so of course, uh, Batman runs like a big basically because of the blimey. They now know. Okay, it's not another invisible man. You know, this is this is slow. You know, where they slowed down the footage. This guy he disappears. He's not like it, it's not. It's not like another Invisible Man, which again is a really great reference to Lloyd Ventrix from See No Evil. It's kind of a nice little, like, yeah, good on you, Dan Reeve. but reference your episode <laughs> in a nice way. It makes sense. That's nice. More people should watch that episode. Anyway, so he has a hunch it's the Clock King, given you know, a clock was stolen. It's a time related thing. And they're just on, for, just for safety's sake, warn Mayor Hill, because <laughs> he has a, <laughs> I doubt time is healed, a fugit's wound, which again makes sense. So then we meet uh, Dr. Wakati, now Tiki. Oh boy, uh, yeah, Doctor Wakati. Yes. I got a yes. voice actor on Wakati. He's one of my favorite people. It's Roscoe Lee Brown. Now Roscoe Lee Brown, he was the voice of the Kingpin in the Spider-Man animated series in the '90s. Every time I, before Vincent D'Onofrio comes around, every time I think of Kingpin, I'm thinking of Roscoe Lee Brown's Kingpin. He was like the Spider-Man <laughs> when Kingpin was a Spider-Man villain. He was Roscoe Lee Brown. And he's Dragon, you're killing me. You're killing me. I'm just you saying the actor, not not specifically here. I'm saying the actor. Okay, you know why you're killing me? I, I admire your admiration, Dragon. I like your admiration is infectious. But big butt. Okay, what do you? Got? This guy is kind of the reason the episode falls apart for me. Honestly, well, he doesn't really do that. What's wrong with him? <laughs> he's so naive. He's so he's so stupid. He's an old man. Give him a break. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like, I just think it's really just, I, it's just really lazy writing to have it, have it be like, oh, Clock King is the assistant to this old man, and he, the old man just trusts him just because he's kind of stupid. All right, I'll give you this. All right, let me, let me, if I can interpret <laughs> for a moment here, okay? I think... Basically, we have a really sci-fi episode with Batman here. Again, season three swings for the fences in a sense that we're going a little broader with Batman. We did the whole you know, Ra's al Ghul, the supernatural angle. We had literal avatars. We, we've done all that sort of... We're going big in season three. Really going very complicated in, in that regard. And we need... Temp- uh, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Wakata here is being... He's the father of the uh, quantum temporal theory. So, a little, little above Batman's pay grade ordinarily. Unless we're, again, we're kind of bleeding into that 50s sci-fi era with Batman here. But again, we're trying to ground it in the animated series. And again, their way of grounding it is just as they... No, no, no. Okay, now that you're saying this, it, it makes sense. Because that is my disconnect. It doesn't feel like Batman. Sure, sure. And that's what I'm saying. I think they're doing the best they can with, like, kind of like an out there, kind of kind of the out there period of Batman right. that they're trying to interpret. Right. And that, that sense, I mean... That, you're, I'll admit it is a little convenient that okay, we just happen to have a guy like this. But again, this oh, is it's good super convenient. Gonna... It's super duper like, convenient. What, what I'm getting at is like pre Justice League, this is as good as they're gonna as natural as they're gonna get this sort of thing going in Batman. Let me ask you know, this. this: What if the technology came from Wayne Corp? Came from Lucius Fox? Yeah, I still that still I think would have the same 
problem. It's like it's too big for Batman, like the whole time manipulation. That's what I'm saying. This is a Justice League matter. But again, what they're doing in the grand scheme of things, they had no idea about this at the time, though. They didn't know they were going to get a Justice League. It's like, OK, let's do something. Let's do something a little next level. But again, the grand scheme of things where we are now, that's above Batman's pay grade. This doesn't doesn't mesh well with the universe we have, the animated series. Like Invisible Man, I can buy. That's light refraction. I hear you. Manipulation of time and space. That's Avengers Endgame. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, point being, as you said, so Dr. Riccati is doing his little experiments. Basically, he has a whole bunch of these devices we just saw in Act 1. Uh, and they're they're hooked up to these items, basically you're slowing down and speeding up and accelerating time. And we reveal uh, the Temple Fugit has been hired as the Doctor's butler, uh, going under the name Harold. I, I do like this element of it, though. I like that... The idea that clocking is 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 going under like an assumed identity as like as a as a butler, that's a clever ruse for the, for Temple Fugit, who is such a, again such a anal retentive you know guy about the about the, the time you know he he would be a perfect butler. I love that idea of him going incognito as a butler, but again just to give him like the excuse of this is how he gets the time thing because he can't invent the, the space and time thing with the clocking that we do have. We can't do that. Why do you write like you're running out of time? <laughs> Sorry, just thought I'd insert a random KMG reference. <laughs> okay. Point is, I like I like the whole I like clocking pretend to be a butler because it fits with what he's good at. Yeah, yeah, I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> okay, so let's see. And then we have a little bit of exposition here. Basically, spell it out for the folks on how this device works. Basically, he demonstrates the slowing and speeding up of time with the little stasis. Basically. Long and short of his, he has like like a bolt, like a lead ball that's dropping very slowly, and he's accelerating like the growth of a plant. And the the noble idea behind this science is that you could you could put people in stasis and you could accelerate you know the toxic waste and get rid of it faster and you know, be it less harmful. Like put them like a little field and speed it up. <laughs> that's that's the intention, which is good. And of course, the big question, the big kind of sci-fi matter of the episode is like this question of is mankind ready for this? And it's important to keep it in the right hands, says Fugit. <laughs> Oh, this is poor. This poor Dr. Burke. He's just trying to enjoy his fruit and build his technology. That's all he wants in life. But <laughs> All right. All right, it's so clocking. He's suiting up. You know, he's, it's, it's time. Dun, 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 dun. I, I will admit, that's a fantastic theme. I know. <laughs> so so basically, clocking, he's, uh, he has this great thing he's talking to. I love how we frame the whole plot. And again, take his really great clue for the episode is that Everything we need to know about the third act is in this newspaper. It's time for me, you and me to renew our acquaintance. And of course, mm -hmm. the paper's about uh, Mayor Hill and the courthouse dedication, which is where the third act's going to take place. Quite nice. So he uses the device and he's off. Meanwhile, we, we check in with Mayor Hill. And you've been, you've been quite the advocate for Mayor Hill. What do you think of I that? have. I like Mayor Hill quite a bit. I think there's some layers to this guy. Yeah. And again, Mayor Hill famously he's he created the clocking, which is really cool with uh, with, with uh, his story too. Another big layer to the guy. So yeah. Hill, he's confident that you know he's uh, he's safe because he's got security and cops all around the block. He's no dummy, and he's smartened up from where he was way back when. He's like, okay, yeah, we're gonna. Def I want I want people to protect me against Fugit, but you know, uh, I I think we're good here. I mean, what's he gonna do? So. Uh. Gordon, he, he fears that he might not be able to get through to the mayor, but uh, thankfully Batman and Robin are they have like a listening device in there. Basically, Gordon has orchestrated a backup plan with Batman and Robin just in case the mayor doesn't want them They're in the They're basically just staking it out, right? Well, yeah, but they have the thing set up on the inside. They have a bat, unbeknownst to the mayor, they have like the little, you know, the blinder thing set up, so. Mm -hmm. But it's a stake out, but they like, they're like, Robin's like, are you sure he's going to show? And of course, Batman has this great line. Sure as night follows day. <laughs> he, knows that, he knows that he's going to show up. Oh, now Bruce, we're... you got to be all poetic all the time, buddy. <laughs> the great thing about Batman, though, with all his villains and parable to, to himself, is that <laughs> all the Batman villains are connected by obsession, which also yeah, Batman yeah, yeah. So, I mean, He knows obsession. He knows there's nothing on this earth that's going to keep the clocking away from exacting revenge or getting, you know, getting what he cosmically has defined as justice for himself. Because Batman knows this, and that's great. Very eloquently said, Dragon. <laughs> okay, so Clock King arrived, like he's stopping like the revolving door, a little revolving door effect, and now he stopped time, he's just cat and this is really, <laughs> again, it's the sci-fi of the episode, but it's, it, it really, it kind of befits the Clock King, if he could control time, he'd be the worst person to give the control of time to, because he'd be really, mo he'd be evil about it, you know, he's just gonna walk it across, you know, he's, he's, he stops time, he's walking across the street, and he's gonna walk into the building, it's quite terrifying for Mayor Hill, if you think about it that way, the man who knows time already can control time. <laughs> 
All right. The slow mo effects quite nice too. I feel like everything kind of goes. The blue. slow mo effects are cool, and there is one moment later on involving the Batmobile. That's another cool moment. The, it, Dragon, that's the thing with this episode. There's like, yeah. th- there's little nuggets of coolness yeah. in this episode. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not gonna say it's horrible, but it. it, it I don't know. I'm more. So we up, have. But. We have this elevator gag where he's like, oh, yeah. oh, what am I thinking? I can't go up the elevator. So he goes up the stairs, and this is a moment I caught in the rewatch. Really kind of that really enchanted me. Or it's like. It's, it's, oh, it's going to be a nasty fall. You have a woman who's basically, she's about to stumble down the stairs and like drop her paperwork and everything. And this is a big moment for the thing in the clock, if you look at it here. It's just, it's, one, it's set up for the gag that's going to kind of be his undoing in a few moments. But also, it's kind of telling how far Clock King is, his own hubris here, where the Clock King is going for revenge against Mayor Hill for the creation of himself, where he was delayed by a few minutes. Like an event like this woman falling down the stairs, for all he knows is exactly what happened to him, where he's unsympathetic towards her. I really kind of captured my imagination on the rewatch. Like, oh, man, just, he's that far gone in his revenge. He's not seeing that he could be, he could help this woman, but he's not. Mm-hmm. Anyway. So uh, then we have he knocks on the door. His great effect is when he knocks on the door, it sounds like machine gun fire, everyone. That's really cool. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> so now they know, okay, it's game time. He's there. Okay, he's doing his thing. So they hear the gunfire. And whose sounds. life are you ruining now? A poor... And in Penitina, an orphan, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, so, I love that he's yeah. so talky about it. He's got arrogant pleasantries, which is, is wonderful. Hello, <laughs> right, Mr. Right. Mayor. And knows he's terrifying the heck out of Mayor. Like he's trying to call the security button. He did make it disappear with the time tag, just bouncing around the rooms. I love how cocky the, the clock king is here. And, of course, the thing I think I, think I should always I should mention with the clock king is that Alan Rackins does the voice... Uh, which I was blown away by. I had no idea. Another Spider-Man connect. He's Norman Osborn in Spectacular Spider-Man. I had no idea about this before. And he's really good. He's unrecognizable in the role. He's fan- it's been years. Uh-huh. I guess he- Anyways, whenever I hear the clock king, I always think of Frost of the Snow because I always hear like the Billy DeWolf as the magician, as Professor Hinkle from... He's like an evil... Oh, version. I can see that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a good call. Like that, and he has like a Paul Freeze, uh, kind of almost like a Paul Freeze laugh later on in this too. It's like an ah. I'll have, to, I'll have to listen for that. I'll have to listen for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll get there. We're getting there close with the Batman okay. So all okay. right. So point being, uh, it's just that, that great delivery of the clock, and was just so arrogant again. This is the, with the man who he's really defined himself by here. And again, I love the idea. He's not going to hurt them. He's like the mirror's like, oh, please don't hurt me. He says. Oh, I'm not going to hurt you because he has a bigger plan for his revenge and to humiliate the mayor on, on a big scale. It's it's going to kill him eventually, but he wants. I, I've been waiting a long time for this. I love how intimidating that is. From the, clock. <laughs> the, the clocking is waiting a long time for something. You should be terrified. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So then Batman and Robin they jump in. They spring into action. Which is great. They hit the button again. Their plan, I think, their plan is really well thought out. Where basically they're they're gonna they're, it's like a like a flashbang grenade almost. Basically, they hit the button. They they have little blinders, little, like LED blinders in the lights here, blind the clocking for a second. They're about to time. Basically, the plan is to tranquilize them. To tranquilize clockings. They don't know if he's doing this naturally or by technology. They have no idea how he's doing. We're gonna trank him, and then that you know that will be it. Like we'll inject him with a sedative. <laughs> Unfortunately, the plan does not go that smoothly. <laughs> you could, he gets his bearings. I'll be it. This is kind of cliche. Where like, yeah, he just kind of he gets one magic hit on Batman, which then gives him just enough time that he needs to do everything. So then he then he's messing with the device. He's like rapping, like you know, he's like Robin gets like spun like the Tasmanian Devil. Uh, so does Batman. Gets like, caught up in his own rope as he tries to tie up Fugit before he leaves the the trank him and everything doesn't go well. Uh, so now clocking, uh, he's making. A, middle, a medium escape, uh, medium speed escape here, where he's like, he's not running out of the building, but he's kind of like, he's, he's kind of walking at a brisk pace while time is slowed down. I like that detail. Mm-hmm. So as he's getting his bearings, what, he, what the clocking uh, failed to remember is that that woman, uh, when the device was turned off, she was continuing about her fall and everything, and like she's now in a different position than he remembered going up the stairs, so he trips over her, which when he contacts somebody, they... <laughs> He then falls down the stairs and everything, and now like time is back, and like now he's be, he's been caught for a moment. <laughs> God, shenanigans! And then like, this lady, you know, I <laughs> the clock king, he had this coming for the for, like not helping her earlier and everything. He's all the all the kind of bad stuff he's doing right now, but still, this lady 
got a bit of an attitude problem. Like, he's just like, get off me. <laughs> she's on top of him. And she's like, you clumsy. She's hitting him with his. She's hitting him with his. <laughs> Where's his lady get off? Oh, God. So, Clock Kling. Uh, Clock Kling. Jesus Christ. Clock King. Please. <laughs> but uh, the police show up. Hold it right there. You're under arrest. And, uh, nope. He stops time. Disappears. Yeah, it switches the, uh, the um, damage device that when she fell on, she damaged the device. We he, he, he uses a different one to stop time, and of course, as he stops time, he uh, he's about to kind of go away in a cl- in a cop car, but the hijack a cop car before he does. Out the other end of the it, Batmobile, which ah. leads. And this is like the frosty timed Paul Freeze moment here, where he's like, ah, okay, yes, yes, I can see it, I can see it, yeah. <laughs> that specific moment. <laughs> yeah, like, the, the timing too. The timing feels a little Rankin Basque. I don't know because I'm always thinking uh, Rankin uh, Basque. Uh, a part of me is always thinking that with, with with the clocking in general. But now it's like it was on my mind. Like, oh, get the, the the timing on that even. Right. <laughs> yeah, so okay, so let's see. Yeah. So he gets a, he sees the Batmobile and he gets a, a wonderful, awful idea. <laughs> oh God. The mayor explains it was a nightmare, basically kind of the aftermath of it all. Like, it was a nightmare. He was there and here and here and everything. Uh, Batman and Robin, they collect the broken pieces of the device. Uh, Batman very smartly, very astutely says, um, I don't think Fugit made this device because he's not a scientist. <sighs> Gordon, Gordon's confident they're going to find him because, you know, there's all there's tracking devices within the cop car. So if he hijacked, he stole a cop car, which the cops who was probably bumped into each other have realized. <laughs> Look at a location off the guy, no problem. Meanwhile, Dr. Wakati. Oh, God. Okay, here we go. Here we go. This guy's so stupid. He's so stupid. He's so fucking stupid. Oh, God. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. What are you guys? He's just like... He's just like yelling for, you know, uh, Harold. But I, but, but I was hungry. I, I, got, I, I need to get that in okay, there. Okay, he's to... looking for Harold. <laughs> uh, he... Basically, he's going down to his room. I don't have the maturity level for this right now, Dragon. I, I, I gathered that. So, <laughs> point, point being, he's in Harold's room, and he's, he's then confronted by a very... Men- it's, I love how, me- how kind of mundanely menacing this is here. Because, again, it's the clock came by the same token, knowing the power that he has in his hand. Right? It's quite menacing. He just mm-hmm. kind of, like, shows up. And it's, it's a menacing conversation leading up to it, though. It's like, what are you doing in my room? And I, I, I read, like, he's such a kind scientist. He's just kind of checking in on the... Uh, <laughs> checking in on his guy. You're like, you know, I thought something might have happened to you. I, I couldn't find you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you know, he kind of, it's, you know, he kind of sounds like he kind of sounds a little bit like the uh, Santa from Nightmare Before Christmas. Does he sound like doesn't what kind yeah, of sound? Kind of vaguely, vaguely, yeah, I could see that. Anyway. And then he he instantly sees the device, like, why are you wearing that? I'm like, because he's betraying you, dude. Because he's not on your side. Okay, you can get the hint. Get the hint. I'm sorry. It pisses me I'm off. I'm gonna say you're coming down on him like like he's a big. I like to think he had faith in humanity. That's what I like to think, but that's just me. Well, I, that know, was his mistake. Yeah, that, I haven't used well, that in a while. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The point being, we cut away. We don't know. Like you know, he's just like a, he's basically going to dispatch with Doctor Wakati, uh, which is like oh, poor Doctor Wakati. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, Gordon and Montoya they're on the scene. Wild. Uh, Yes, meanwhile. <laughs> Gordon and Montoya, they're on the scene. They find the ditch cop car in the water. They're fishing it out. Uh, Gordon calls for a five-mile dragnet that basically he couldn't have gotten far. And not realizing, yeah, the device. If he still, they, don't know if, they don't know he still has the time device. So even oh. the point, really, They now are figuring it's a device, but the device got broken. So they have, but he got away. The point being, the jury's out. There's like, we're five-mile dragnet. We're hopefully we'll find him. Mm-hmm. little side note, a little catch. A little kind of office ladies catch, if you will, on the rewatch. Oh, yes. <laughs> Um, I think uh, given Montoya eventually she becomes a detective once we do the revamp uh, you'll notice she's not quite in the, in the uniform blues this episode I like the, my little head cannon. Gordon was mentoring Montoya so she can make detective that's why she's like on the scene here oh. nice nice I can see that okay so Batman right. has an idea <laughs> yes so given uh, you know, given the uh, you know, Clock King's knowledge of train schedules again built into the origin of the Clock King with you know, Mayor Hill and everything uh, he probably uh, took the train, which is basically like a trellis or something uh, around them. Well, um, 
will take the he probably took the train knows the schedule that's how he got away he just ditched the car took the train schedule where's the train lead what well, leads to the mountains cranston estates where brian cranston lives <laughs> got to make that joke right yeah i got to work that in there that's inevitable <laughs> cranston estates oh boy yeah. brian cranston's just gonna show up like hey clocking <laughs> okay oh god Okay, so let's see. So, um, Batman exposits, um, basically, uh, exposits to, to Robin, uh, that, uh, you know, Doctor, uh, they're, the technology, uh, the only guy who lives out there is a, is a Professor uh, Wakati. Uh, Professor Wakati, he, of course, Wataki, no, Wakati, I love the little correcting things, it's like a mushroom or something. <laughs> <laughs> basically, yeah, uh, Professor Wakati, the, uh, the father of, um, of the temporal, the temporal study of time, basically the structure of time, uh, quantum temporal, temporal theory. theory. Yes, quantum yeah. temporal theory. Yes. So let's see. So the Batmobile, uh, the, the the device underneath the Batmobile activates, and then we have a very Batman Returns death trap <laughs> enacted. <laughs> and this is like I think unequivocally probably the coolest part of the episode. Pretty neat. <laughs> We're trapped in time. Yep, so they, again, of all the death traps to put Batman and Robin in, this is the coolest sci fi version of those. I and think so. I think if, so. If yeah. 60s Batman could have gone <laughs> one more season, if they had a budget, you know they would have attempted something like this, and it would have been cool. I mean, I could see this sort of thing being done in like Star Trek, right? And it was yeah. right around the same time period, so yeah, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> so, point being, t uh, the death trap itself right now is again kind of a la Batman Returns packaging where we put something on the bottom of the Batmobile to hijack it in some way, shape, or form, and we kind get ourselves out of it very much like Batman Returns, which is cool. Um, time is accelerating as uh, basically the Batmobile is is in stasis and it's building kind of mass and speed essentially. Basically, it's not moving, but time and space around it is moving, which is really trippy and really cool. Um, and the danger is the longer they stay, just like like this figuring this out, if a car hits them, that's going to be like an atomic explosion. <laughs> And we have a bit of a spelled out gag, but I'll take it. Like last time I checked, E equals M, M E equals M C squared. Last time I checked. <laughs> then the the little Batman returns now is basically Batman uses the grappling gun to uh, to basically fire uh, the he pinpoints where the device is on the car. He grappling he grapple guns it off the car. Clever, and, very clever, very clever. Yeah, I always love him using that grappling gun to get out of dodge, man. I could uh, look for it. <laughs> so now now the device is off the Batmobile, but again Batmobile. Built a lot of speed, built a lot of momentum. Uh, it's it's not going to be pretty. So the bad was like then just rushing off and then around her steering for dear life into a pole, essentially. Also, just random observation. I love how the name Stewart is written on the building that they're parked near. Yeah. Just why? Yeah. <laughs> Must have been like an animator or something. I'm guessing. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyways. So, uh, Batmobile's out of commission, uh, and they have and they're. It looks like uh, they're out 48 hours. Like they, you know, like 48 hours have gone by, mm -hmm. which is heady. Again, it's them being trapped for like for like, for like less than five minutes. 48 hours have passed. <laughs> so then they take the bat cycles to uh, Cranston Estates. Um, the duo find Wakati in a stasis field. Thank God, Fuga didn't kill him. God, <laughs> Wakati's in stasis. They freed him. Like, oh no, Harold, don't. So. Uh, Clock King, uh, he's, let's see, uh, oh yeah, so Clock King, he's now using the device, he's at the, at the big dedication for the courthouse, the big podium, the idea is like, uh, Hill's gonna use this oversized gavel, to, like, to usher in the courthouse, like, I'm gonna usher in this courthouse, gavel, gavel. <laughs> Dragon, I just want to point out that my, I had a gavel come into work today, and I was just like, oh, if only I would have had this for judging Saul. Well, you, don't you still have a season left. You'd realize that, right? Well, yeah, but I'm not going to do the whole thing on video. Fuck that. Well, I mean, still for the sound of it all, just for like a moment. Anyway, we're, sorry, we're getting off track here. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dragon, like you, you know how you you know how I looked in those videos, man. I, 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 I'm, not I say, I'm just saying this for you that. to have and like a memento, maybe. But anyway, <laughs> look, right. I'll I'll see if it's been put on the floor yet. All right, I'll, I'll uh, see if I can still grab it. <laughs> okay, so um, 
Okay, point being, clocking his, his big plan here. He's fiddling with the props uh, for the mayor's dedication for the courthouse. And now this jelly bean guy, right? So the cops are like, they're standing guard. And of course, like, one is like, you're trying to like flick a jelly bean into his mouth. Clocky just takes the jelly bean, does the successful version of the flick while time is a standing still. Little mm -hmm. time gags. He plants a bomb, a pressure sensitive bomb underneath the podium. So when he hits the podium, the reverberations will trigger a bomb that'll take out Ham uh, Hill and the crowd. Mm hmm. So again, the, again, this is the danger of clocking with unlimited time. You can cook up, you can concoct uh, really horrifying plans like this. So Wakati, uh, he explains that you know the herald of it all, like he, used, he worked for me, he had no idea it was the clocking. The, um, of course, uh, he mentioned uh, the last thing he said before he left was the mayor getting his day in court. Uh, before also, he, he, I just want to point out, he says like Harold was like the only person he trusted, and I'm like. Dragon, I just want to know the genesis of this relationship. That's what I want to know. As in, you want me to, like, fill in the blanks, or you just you want it to lacking in the episode? <laughs> well, I don't necessarily want you to fill in the blanks, but it definitely is lacking in the episode. I'll admit, one more scene just kind of established... I think maybe either one more scene or maybe a better scene establishing the relationship between two of them. I wouldn't have heard at all. I'm saying, because, like, as it stands now, I'm just kind of like, I don't even buy how these two like how this guy is like trusting clocking with like everything you know i i just i don't know it's weird that's a recluse and a guy who just shows up really professional good at his job that's the only logic i can really kind of really infer from it. it's just he's just good at his job and he trusts him because of that you know it's, i don't know all right fair enough fair enough i'll cite knives out but it won't do much good okay oh, so God. <laughs> all right let's see um Okay, so anyways, the point being like the uh, you know the the mayor's going to get his day in court, uh, which again continues the irony of, uh, of fate between. Again, it is a really great uh, plan to get revenge on Hill too, because again, the big uh, origin between them screwed him out of a court case. Mm -hmm. So yet again, it's it's kind of cosmic. It's kind of a cosmic fate thing going on here. It's, it's quite it's quite brilliant on Clock King's part. Okay, let's see. So now it's uh, I believe it's supposed to go off at uh, ten o'clock. Yeah, ten o'clock, and that which means they have two minutes. Yeah, they had two minutes because of all the time they lost. There's no way they're going to get there. And then there's then the, they try calling. They call the police. They call Gordon or something. No, no chance of it because the phone line is a dead zone out here. They have no phones. Mm -hmm. the, the electromagnetic interference would be too much for the experiment. So they're boned. They got nothing. They're doomed. Everyone's dead. I'll tell you. All right. End of episode. So final thoughts, Dragon. <laughs> Well, it was it was a rather dark one, I gotta say. It was, it was awful, but I, mean, I, I mean, it's realistic, I guess. You know, I can't, can't win them all. Okay, no, no, it's just actually. All right. So, it looks like there's no hope uh, to make a half-hour trip in two minutes. But, of course, hey, it's like, I'm in a time machine. I have all the time I need. <laughs> <laughs> basically they realize oh my god we have these time devices and batman of course really uh, you have 30 seconds to show us how, how to use these i feel oh. like i feel like at me like this guy kind of deserved batman being a little harsh on him frankly <laughs> well he didn't have time to read in the riot act <laughs> literally he didn't have I, I mean i'm to... just batman batman could have just been like could you please help me fix this? But no, he's he's not wasting any time, and he gets right out of business. <laughs> All right. So we then now we're in the sci-fi third act of the whole affair here. So this is a it's a it's an out there idea. It's Batman with super speed in broad daylight. <laughs> We all know how we feel about Batman in broad daylight, right, Dragon? Isn't it just the best? But they get, it, 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 they get it. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. I'll give it a pass because they were trapped for 48 hours in that Batmobile, so they couldn't really help it. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> anyway, so let's see. The point being, uh, you know, again, they're like, but, you know, with super speed and everything, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's, um, on the bat on the on the bat cycles at super speed, and you know, Robin's can coin the line like faster than a speeding bullet. He's, he's loving this. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's see so the mayor the mayor is dedicating the building the new courthouse uh of course hilly's kind of hamming it up as he tends to go hey hammy sorry a little penguin line there <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see stand back folks this, this could be dangerous stand back of course a little bit the mayor usher the new building in 
with a bang. <laughs> the clock he's just savoring this moment, knowing he can slow oh, yeah. it down. Oh, he really is, man. He really is. Oh my god. <laughs> Which again, that's the brilliant again, the episode out there as it may be, it's still it's like, you know what? It's it's the clock and being able to relish time like this is so in, it's so fun to see. <laughs> So Batman and Robin, they arrive. Uh, they run. They, I love this. They literally to the last second they arrive. They run to stop it, but they're too late. And I love how they're just, like knocking the thing out of his hand in slow mo, and everything's like not like they're moving at regular speed, like knocking the <laughs> knocking everything out there, like knocking the gavel out. Uh, it's, oh, it's too late. He already triggered it. So this. And this is a proof, this is one of the great enduring things about Batman. You can put Batman in any situation. Again, 60s Batman being a testament to this. You can put him in any situation. Even in the 50s Batman, like the 50s sci-fi era Batman, like we're kind of homaging here. So long as Batman, as far as I'm concerned, so far as Batman, you know, he sticks to his guns of, like, saving people and putting himself on the line at any cost, you do Batman right. In that regards, in that regard, we have this awesome moment. It's basically this awesome version of Dark Knight Rises and Batman 66 where the animated series does their turn, takes their turn on the whole Batman running with a bomb moment, but they do it really awesomely in a sci-fi way where Batman runs with the detonating bomb in his hand outside the city, uh, trying to, and he puts a device on trying to slow down the blast as much as he can. Again, uh, sci-fi, yet quintessential Batman. He throws the bomb at the very last second. Boom! Again, awesome Batman save. Can never take that away from the episode. <laughs> Out there, the so clock king's trying to get away, and of course now we've rebranded as the Batman and Robin adventure. So Robin has to do something. So, so uh, Robin trips the clock king again. You don't really need the it's not much of a knuckle down drag out fight with the clock king. So, because <laughs> he's the clock king. So Robin trips him, uh, which he then breaks his device upon the fall. Looks like you just ran out of time. <laughs> And we have like a little transition there's like Robin's apprehending him. So then we have a little kind of like coda here, a little epilogue coda where uh, Batman Wakati or Chat and Wakati saying it's a sh- return the device to him. It's a shame they have to keep these devices secret. Uh, you know the world. Yeah, the world is not the world's not ready for it yet, as we demonstrated. Too bad for Fugit because I'm sure he'll he'll wish he had something to make the days make the time pass faster. Where he's going, the so clock king's card away. That's it. That's the ending. All right. So, final thoughts. Yeah, what do you got? Um, well, you know, there's moments. There's moments sprinkled throughout this episode that are kind of fun. You know, Clock King has a few fun lines. Some cool, trippy sci-fi concepts. Overall, Dragon, like I said, I, I, I'm sorry to keep harping on this, but the, uh, the scientist guy just really is the, my main sticking point. <laughs> I'm sorry. It, it's too convenient. I won't fight, Sean. So, <laughs> final thoughts for me. Uh, you know, again, it doesn't it doesn't hold a candle to the first clocking appearance by any stretch, but what could? Let's be honest. Uh, but again, in, in season three, where we're building on continuity and we're getting a little bit more sci-fi, a little more supernatural, a little bit more like going going out there with things. And again, homage to fifties Batman, depending on how you look at it. Which again, I can appreciate that. I don't love it, but I can appreciate it. It aids in uh, in kind of building. It aids in the in creating, you know, the the building of a greater DCAU. I mean, eventually we get a flash. We're kind of dealing with super speed here. So again, we're kind of building to that sort of thing in the grand scheme of things. You know, it's. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, again, Clock King. He's wonderfully in character, and he kind of grounds the premise. We ground the premise as much as we can, but still, it's bad notes with, with, with time travel in there. It's, it, it's out there. <laughs> okay. All right. What's next, Dragon? <clears throat> Catwoman returns. Reform turned rogue team up. A taxidermy catastrophe. Can Batman talk sense into Selina Kyle? Or will this cat walk a dark path in a crossroad of destiny? Tune in next time and find out. Same animated bat time, same animated bat place. On the next visit to the Animated Batcave with Catwalk. Blind. Blind.